why would you listen to me? Um, I spent the last four years mostly doing consulting, helping companies either set up their um, data science teams or becoming data driven. And for the last year and a half, I've been running the analytics department at GoOpti, which is a transportation startup. We, off we offer on-demand shared transports to and from airports. So we're doing something similar as Uber Pool does, but on longer distances and we're way better at packing many people into the same van. So obviously by doing something like that, data is the core of our everyday. And so uh, my talk today is going to be a combination of both lessons learned and the tools we're using and some of the tools we're building in what I see sort of the ideal process of doing data science or at least a step towards that. Now, first, I have a small confession. Um, we don't, f for the majority, we don't really have what we would, would consider big data. So all this talk is, is geared at working with data which fits in your memory. All, at the same time, I also dare say that I think a lot of you are in the same boat. Nowadays, we have so much memory available on machines that big data is oftentimes just a case of trying to follow the hype or not really thinking the whole thing through while you could actually just have a stronger machine and work with it. So if your data is actually truly big, more power to you, then a lot of those things I'm going to talk about don't make sense to you. The rest of you, let's get on to it. So I'd like to start with some <coughs> what I would uh, theme design constraints. I mean, these are, these are the core lessons that I've picked on the many mistakes I've made during my career doing data science. Um, the first, and this is probably one of the most important things you can take from this talk, is that the speed to answer matters greatly when doing data science. Uh, because it's a question of then how data can be incorporated into other companies' day-to-day -day processes. If you have the ability to provide an answer in less than two minutes, this means that during any brainstorming, during any meeting, you can pull up the numbers, even if you don't have them prepared in advance, and use them. And this is what I believe being data-driven actually means, that you can get actionable data which you weren't even prepared to, so you have a new question before you, and you can answer it quick enough that it doesn't disrupt the flow of a brainstorming. And this is the goal we are striving for. So all the tools and the approaches you'll see in my talk are geared towards how can I minimize the time it takes for an answer. Now the next sort of level of how long it takes are those tasks which can be done in about 20 minutes. Why 20 minutes? It's not a specific magic number, but 20 minutes is something that we can usually stuff somewhere in our day and still have the answer relatively quickly. Because every, everything more than about 20 minutes probably means that you have to uh, budget for it in terms of your um, plan or backlog or whatever methodology you're using, and this usually means it's going to take a week, maybe two weeks for the answer to arrive. And oftentimes, by that point, uh, it's going to be relevant because the conversation is going to move onwards or there are going to be new, more pressing questions. So you're basically just doing something for sake of doing while not providing value by you uh, <coughs> digging into data. So we have this chasm of basically anything more than 20 minutes, anything that you can't more or less answer in the same day is just wasted time. And then obviously there are large projects where you need to set up a new ETL pipeline or something like that, and this is a separate case. But mostly when there's the case that you get a question from somebody else in the business, it's vital, of vital importance that you can answer this question quickly. The second thing is, and this is quite obvious to anyone who's worked with data, but it bears repeating, always, always think in terms of distributions, not just numbers you can, no matter how um, advanced you are in statistics, there is always another view that can be um, um, uh, overlooked or overshadowed. While if you think in distributions, you get a much better handle of what's going on. So again, this, why I'm um, speaking, I'm uh, emphasizing this is that this also means that you, we need to strive for development environments which allow very simple and painless visualizations as we go along. So at each point in time that we can also visualize what we're working with, and this obviously helps us that we always have our data in mind and in a very visual sense in mind. Third thing, no throwaway um, analysis. This is, this is one thing that has plagued me time and again, that you get something, a question that seems so um, out of the left field that you do the analysis and you submit the answer and then you one way or the other throw the code away or you 
bury it somewhere in a large notebook or whatever. And this is problematic because this is what's going to bite you in the behind at some point. Because either it's going to turn out that even though it sounded like it's going to be a one-time thing, you need something very similar again, or maybe there was a mistake and now you have to track down how this mistake came about. So basically, always have an audit trail of how you came about your analysis. Never settle for just throw away and have the results, send it in an email and be done with it because this is going to be so, so much more difficult when you're trying to get back to this and figure out either why did I get the result that I got or um, just trying to redo the same thing again and you're just repeating yourself, which means that instead of providing answers quickly, you're spending more time needlessly. Uh, the last um, design part of, my, of design and philosophy for any data and analytics stack is I think that the results have to be shareable. And with, with that in mind, I think that, uh, and this is continuing from the previous point, the worst thing you can do is do a, the analysis and then dump it into an Excel file and send this Excel file over email. Why? Because this is, has several problems. One of them is that the data is almost immediately stale. The second one is that you can then, you have then those version 2 and version 2.0 and version 2.0 dash new and some of that and nobody knows which version is canonical. And this, what this does is, first of all, it oftentimes invalidates your answers because they're simply wrong or not up to date. And second of all, it reduces um, the trust other people have in the analysis because there's always this question, is this the right version? Oh, I have it somewhere in the email, whatever. So it's a problem. But the better solution is to have some way of sharing a canonical version. In, our, in this case, probably somewhere in your, on your intranet where everybody can reach it via an, a unique URL which everybody knows. And once you have that, you can also do a couple of other things you can um, concentrate all the discussion around it. Don't have the discussion about results over email. This is problematic because, um, first of all, just browsing through old threads in email is painful. It's very painful. And the second bigger problem is that once you get new people in your team, they're going to have a hell of a hard time figuring out what, those thing, what the results mean if they have to shuffle through various old email threads, which then continue with a lot of discretions and so forth, while if you concentrate the discussion around the actual analysis, this is not a problem because it becomes, in a way, self-documenting, and not just self-documenting in terms of the code, but also self-documented, documenting in terms of the processes and thinking that was going on in the company as this question was posed and as this answer was presented. So try to have it um, searchable in some way and discoverable, again, um, reducing the number of repeated requests and just helping people explore data. Um, this, and this is an amazingly um, empowering thing, that just giving people the ability to browse various results that you did for other departments or for other people, that uh, oftentimes then gives other people new insights, new um, questions that they pose that they wouldn't even think about doing it. And if it's in a way that is, that the consuming it is very passive, it helps because it's not so um, intimidating. If you have to, anytime you have to specifically ask, people don't like that. People don't, are always afraid. The more they're um, disconnected from the data, the more they're disconnected from the analysis, the more that people tend to be sort of afraid that the answer they're going to get, they're going, they don't, won't understand it and then they'll have to ask or something like that. But if it's just a browsable repository of previous analysis, anybody could just click around and look at things. And this sort of doesn't put you in the spotlight and yet you can get various answers that you didn't even expect. And this is again greatly empowering for all the other people in your organization. And of course, last but not least, um, include methodology, in this case, code with your results. This is another big problem with if you then, at the end, dump your data into Excel or something like that. Because then it's the question, oh, how did we calculate this? Um, what were the cutoffs, whatever? What was the method of rounding of how did we took the mean? There's so many um, things that seem quite obvious when you're doing them, but when you're returning to a result three months in, it's oftentimes not clear how you came to a solution. So. Um, also include the code. This is, these are the, these four um, constraints are what sort of informed my decisions on how to build our analytics stack. Um, so let's get to it. Now, the first thing is 
um, especially since we're coming from a Lisp tradition, this question of what the ED, uh, IED should be. Should it be primarily um, kind of, sort of, um, built around the concept of a REPL or a notebook? Now, obviously, in the Python world or in the R world, uh, it's, they choose notebook. But we have a very strong tradition, also very strong tooling in terms of REPL. So which one is best? Well, I, first of all, I think that we don't have to pick just one, but if I were forced to pick one, I would pick notebooks. Why? Because I think, and this is just specifically for the case of doing uh, data science or analytics, because um, I think that one thing that's problematic in such cases is that REPL is quite ephemeral in, th in terms of how uh, you just sort of um, have this stream of computations, while um, with a notebook you can group similar things together and we have this spital grouping. And I feel that this is very important that you can sort of have topic grouping instead of just um, going by time, because otherwise, if you have just a linear timeline, all the various digressions just mean that the picture becomes more obscured. But as I said, um, fundamentally, I don't want to choose, because at the same time, I'm also, in a lot of ways, a very poor closure programmer. I have a very limited memory of various library functions, and uh, every two months I have to try out some form of the structuring, how it actually works, and what works and what doesn't. Um, so for, and for things like that, a REPL is great, because these things are actually throwaway. So there are two things. One is analysis, which is not entirely throwaway, but it's me exploring, and it might be worthwhile returning to it, at least as a sort of a pointer into how I was thinking. And, but there are also things that are just me thinking around the tools, thinking around libraries and trying stuff like that, and this is something that can safely be thrown away, and this is where a REPL shines. So, Ideally, we would have something like that, a combination of a notebook and a REPL. And as luck would have it, we can be quite close to that already. So presenting the first part of our stack. We start off with a hacked instance of Gorilla REPL, which is currently uh, the best, almost the only, but definitely the best um, notebook implementation for closure, and has a couple of very uh, nice architectural solu uh, solutions, which I'll get to in a moment, and we've then tacked on some other features. The most notable ones are we've added auto refresh, so ev mostly every day all our notebooks get automatically recomputed, so the data is never stale, but every time you return to it, you know that it's going to be at at most one day old, which for our needs is good enough. But you could, you could refresh the in principle with any pre, um, period that you need. And the second big addition is that we've tacked on Hypothesis IS to it. Hypothesis is sort of uh, the, this is the stuff on the left, and it's an idea that it's going to be an annotation layer over whole of the internet. But as luck would have it, it's an open source project and you can have your own private instance. So we're using Hypothesis um, to, to do all the comments and discussions around various alliances. And this is this part I was talking about how we want to concentrate all the discussions in one place. And um, it also gives us more text, which means that we can then have better search and better discoverability and so forth. So going through all the features that this relatively simple system gives us is that, um, as I said, we can have questions, comments, and annotations and so forth alongside what the actual analysis. Um, the data is being kept alive by periodically refreshing. Um, we have discoverability just by virtue of having nodes of text interposed with our analysis, and this can then be searched by a Elasticsearch or whatever you want. But, uh, um, Hypothesis already comes with its own instance of Elasticsearch, so we're using that. It's sh it lives on the intranet, so it's shareable. Um, we could also share it outside of our organization if we wanted, and we've also added code hiding, so it's not as intimidating to people who don't really care about code, but you can still always click and get to see the code, so we have this property of um, self-documentation and understanding methodology. And with this, you, we actually um, can get surprisingly far, because what's happening now is that 
more and more we're just using notes, such notebooks instead of dashboards. When we started, um, we had all these fancy dashboards with custom D3 visualizations and they were a true um, labor of love. We put a lot of time into them. They were nice to use, flashy, very, f all the interac interactions were very well thought out. But um, ultimately, it also meant that it took quite a while to develop them. And alternatively, using a dashboard such as this, uh, using a notebook such as this, means that we can iterate very, very quickly. Um, also due to the other part of the stack, the library I'm going to show you. Um, so we're now using more and more such dashboards and they turn out to be good enough, but at the same time, because we can crank them out so much faster, they actually have m more positive impact in terms of the needs of the business than having very well thought out and very nice dashboards. Um, one thing that greatly aids the power of this stack is the shared runtime. So basically how Gorilla REPL works is that it starts an N REPL instance and then evaluates all the cells in N REPL. Standard closure stuff. But what this means is that if you are a bit crafty with N REPL middleware, you can then have your code that's running in the notebooks interact with your runtime. So what and this is a simple example, but for instance, if we want to print an infinitive sequence, we can then just, for this case, Rify the protocol which is, done, which is used for rendering and say, okay, render this as this. And instantly we get just the um, crimped sequence of the first 10, um, 10 elements instead of uh, the whole thing locking up because we want to realize an infinite sequence. And this approach is very powerful because it allows us to gradually increase complexity of the of what our notebooks are. So there isn't this clear delineation of between notebooks or dashboards, and also there isn't this clear delineation between the environment and uh, what we're doing with it. Now contrast this with something like IPython, or rather Jupyter, which makes it way more complex to extend the environment. Obviously it allows way more than this simple approach, but this is again one of those 80-20 things where with something like this that you can have custom way how you um, print out the data gives you a lot, a lot of flexibility and power with very little complexity and you don't have to think about it and you don't have to really support in terms of deployment or anything. It's just more code which you're extending. And this is one thing that I'm quite sad that we're sort of forgetting the learning lesson of Lisps in past where it was basically the development environment was written in the same language as you were also programming, and or the, the small talk was the same. And we've now, with Emacs mostly being the default choice, it's still a Lisp, but it's not the same runtime that you're also programming. So you have this very clear delineation between your um, IDE and the code you're doing. And I think that's a great missed opportunity. So I was really, bullish when light uh, table came out, but it sort of seemed to stall. But it's definitely, I think that the way forward are such tools. Uh, rather, in terms of closure script, a lot of things are moving in the right direction with FigWheel and tools like that. And I think that this is something that is one of the Lisp lessons that we do have to re, sort of relieve, reinvent, and reinternalize, and it's going to greatly increase our productivity and also the, just the outlook of what it means to do programming. So, but still, things are not perfect. Um, there are a lot of rough edges. First of all is that the current editor that uh, Gorilla REPL uses is quite horrible, some version of code mirror, but it's pretty broken, especially if you're using it to edit something like S expressions. So integrating something such as Pernifier would be super nice, but yeah, getting to it. Um, the REPL right now, is, the REPL is right now um, not implemented as a part of Gorilla REPL, which would be nicer, but I'm just using an Emacs instance to connect to the same N REPL, which again, good enough, but would be nice to have it all in one. Um, as usual for closure tooling, uh, expression reporting is problematic, but since there are now a lot of projects in closure land which are 
attacking the problem of exception reporting and exploration in different ways, um, I think that we're in a lot better shape than we used to be. And last but not least, um, it would be nice to have more sort of browsable data structures and so forth. So um, interactivity right now is somewhat limited because the only means of interactivity are through code. But um, I think that going forward, in some ways, just the ability to click and build down via clicking would be a great asset. Even if you have like a huge dictionary or some complex data structure, sometimes it just makes sense that you're able to click and just look at the patterns in terms of structure. And this is something that's, even if you're using some form of pretty printing, it's either all or nothing. And I think that here, just having this sort of browsable would be a good um, addition. But this is the last point is way less important than the, the previous ones. Okay, so we have the environment and now, what do we, how do we program in it? Here, another closure luminary, uh, Cray Miller. Uh, and it, I very much agree with this sentiment. Um, there's this artificial division between data scientists on one hand and engineers or programmers or what they want on the other hand. And I think this is greatly problematic and also detrimental both in terms of the tools we get and how we approach this. Uh, so I really try to embrace this aspect of working with data which is sort of just transformations of data, re-encoding, restructuring. Um, one thing that really struck me, me ever, ever since hearing it is that what we do um, when we're solving problems with computers is that actually we know how to solve about three problems and then we're very, very good at translating other problems to those three problems. But just this act of translation means a lot of structural transformations mm -hmm. and this is something where Clojure is very, very well positioned to do that. But at the same time, the um, the predominant way of thinking in term in the land of data science is the exact opposite. Um, and this brings me to my biggest gripe, which is the, the unnecessary usage of data frames. Um, because fundamentally, I think that in languages such as Clojure, they are in most cases a huge disservice. Why? Because fundamentally, what a data frame is, it conflates two different things. It conflates um, representation and abstraction. So it's in a way it's a table which um, very much limits how you think about it and how you interact with it, but um, and it just limits what you can do with it. And if all your steps of transform transforming data need to conf conform into some form of a table, this is vastly limiting. So I think uh, a way better approach is to embrace as much as possible the closure way of just transforming various collections into one form or the other. Maybe you start off with a vector of maps and then you have a map of vectors or whatever and next step again it's a vector or something like that. And those internal representations, what they do is they encode some of the computation you would otherwise have to do just in numerical terms. But here you can just encode it in structure. And this is a way better match for, for first closures capabilities and also, at least for me, just the way I think about problems. Not all problems in, when you're doing data science, map nicely to some concept of linear algebra. Sure, when you just have more or less numerical data, but as soon as you have mixed data, um, oftentimes when trying to do various groups and so forth, this model breaks down. And as any of you who've done any work in Pandas can probably attest, the moment you start working with various group buys, the whole experience becomes way more painful than it needs to be. And it has a lot of corner cases because you are at the point when you start to think about groupings, it's the point where you're sort of already at the edge of what a data frame can um, accommodate. So instead of that, um, my approach is to basically have an virtual data frame in a way specified only in terms of functions on it. And with the constraint that um, I want seamlessly to jump in and out of vanilla closure and then just have some additional functions which operate on the same normal closure data structures uh, with specific operations which are geared towards exploratory data analysis or whatever. Um, and to do that, ultimately, 
I've built m my own library to, to do that, um, which you are very much inv um, invited to check out. And so now in this part of the talk, I'm going to talk about some of the dec decisions behind uh, this library and how it came about. Um, I don't think that this is necessarily the be all and all of data analysis, but it's, some, uh, but it's something that's very intimately tied to how I approach problems and uh, very, it's basically a case of scratching my own niche. And what I'm doing with this talk in a way is also trying to sort of reverse engineer my thinking that went into this because now it might seem that I have all these theoretical approaches to the whole thing, but it actually just, um, all the functions in it are basically just me looking at the patterns which kept repeating in my working and I was like, hey, can I abstract this and can I use this as a general function? And then as most of you probably do, you have this um, toolbox library that just keeps growing and growing and eventually it end up with uh, this. So uh, the second thing I'm very concerned about and v value highly is composability meaning that I want most of the things being composable in both in terms of threading mac macros, in terms of using partial, and everywhere where there is a DSL, I want a DSL which is defined in terms of closure data structures, not as a macro. Why? Because then also you can compose and you can use normal closure to generate your DSL which then um, influences, the comp which then computes something. It is, this concrete implementation is reasonably fast, mostly due to transducers, otherwise I didn't really put much effort into making it efficient, but it works fast enough for most of our needs. I'm going to talk about some obvious um, improvements at the end. Uh, it's also, and this is one point where there is actually um, a division between the world of engineering practices on one hand and data analysis the other. And this is that sometimes I think that it's worthwhile to have a library which um, encapsulates what Emacs, for instance, calls do what I mean. Meaning that um, in a way the program comes towards you and anticipates your needs. This, in a way, this is also a continuation or rather a very primitive form of what you've been hearing before about um, acts of speech and how sort of this relationship develops through an interaction of speaking. And here, I want in a limited scope the same thing that the, the library anticipates some of my needs and just does the right thing, meaning that um, it's not choosy in terms of what form of inputs it takes. It can be a vector or it can be just a singular element or it can be a map which is then um, handled correctly for most cases. Um, but what this also means is that it has corner cases. And in this is this clash because when you're doing something which is pure engineering, I think you don't really want uh, weird corner cases because it just makes um, maintenance harder, it makes understanding code harder. But here in the case when you're doing basically exploratory data analysis and when you want to have the answer fast, it's better to sometimes be tripped by a corner case when the library is being too smart than having to have a couple of extra key press or a couple of um, extra functions that you always need to call. So it's a trade-off that works, I feel, when doing analysis, but it, it's not something I would encourage when using when writing some production code. Also, I wanted a library which requires minimal buy-in in terms of that you can just use a single function and be done with it so we don't have to um, rework your whole approach of how you structure your program and how you work with your program. For instance, there was a mention before of component framework for closure, which is something I really, really dislike for the simple reason that it requires way too much buy-in. I don't, th um, and I know this is a contentious issue, but I think that one of the beauties of closure is exactly how orthogonal various libraries are. And the moment you have a library which forces you to structure your whole program, and with that, this is more important, not just your program, but your thinking around the way it works, I think that's a problem which detracts from the ultimate power of closure. And the last point, as I said, um, I'm a big fan of 
various structure manipulations and transformations. So the whole, the whole library is built with this in mind. So everywhere you can have uh, extra arguments to reach into the structure and just pull some of the bits out and work on those, but still keep the overall structure intact. If you're thinking, is this something like uh, the Spectre library? Yes, but in a way more limited way. Okay, so uh, an example which probably won't make any sense whatsoever, but I'm just gonna show off the highlights. Um, as I said, um, is this? No. Uh, we, want to sw we want to have a combination of working with just the built-in functions and then we just add some of our additional functions, but the whole thing is very vanilla closure overall and it doesn't really re require you to change all that much. Second thing, uh, I said I'm a big fan of various compositions, so just assembling things uh, together uh, where partial usually just works in a convenient way so you don't have to have those um, awkward function where you just need the first parameter. And this also incidentally, um, the, dif the difference between partial and function is, FN is big in terms of because partial bec uh, creates a closure of all arguments, so it pre-calculates them, and mostly because we're working with, without side effects, this is exactly what you want. So you can just, the right thing um, in terms of performance is usually by using partial because then everything is computed just once and doesn't get recomputed every time. But it's also sometimes something that can bite you um, if you want to have more or you need more calculations. Um, I'm also, a, and this is another departure from what I gather is the closure way. Uh, I'm a big proponent of having curried versions where possible. Um, not just in the sense of like what the transducers do, but actually just having the last argument, which usually tends to be the data set that you put in, be um, optional and have a curried version of that because this allows you to then compose again the functions better together. Um, so when I was talking about um, how all, if the DSLs are made of just closure data structures, we can generate them programmatically, and here we have the example of that. Um, Summary uses a very simple DSL, which is mostly just a map of um, from fields to functions, but here we are generating it on the fly um, and using that, and the whole thing just works, which is something which, would, which wouldn't be possible if um, we would use macros. So. Um, and this is a pattern which, in a way, it's um, sort of nasty. And again, I probably wouldn't use it um, as readily in something which would be deemed production code, but it can be a huge time saver um, if you just want to generate something, uh, some form of a sort of repetitive analysis, like in this case when I want to have a mean for all the hours in the day. This is a very concise way of doing it. Uh, so I already talked about composability, uh, just sort of, again, the uh, key highlights. And also one thing that if you are diligent with trying to tailor your APIs to confront to being usable with partial and threading and so forth is that you obviously get a very consistent API, which is also nice. So you don't usually have to think very much about it because you know the last argument is going to be my data set and then before that it's going to be functions, blah, blah, blah. Um, so again, this is all those small things that reduce how much you have to think about things, and, but it will adds up and helps you reduce the number of mistakes you make. Uh, and the other thing is, if with composability, what I find is that it emphasizes structure better. And this is one of the things that um, is what's so enticing for me with Lisp, that computation is in a way encoded in the, in the structure and it is also visual. So when you can just scan Lisp code, it's, it becomes quite apparent what's going on even if you don't actually read the, the specific tokens by just by how the indents works and so forth. And I think this is something that's oftentimes overlooked when we're talking about what are the benefits of closure or Lisp or whatever, but it can be very powerful once it becomes part of your blood. Uh, but still, there are some 
uh, points where you can have problems. One of them is in Clojureland this um, uh, null punning, which is a nice thing, but it's also a problem because what then happens is that your the, the point where your program explodes can be very far removed from the point where you actually made the mistake. Um, so, uh, and this is, if you're, when you're trying to optimize, to really iterate as fast as possible, this is a problem because you want the whole thing to explode as soon as possible because this gives you the best possible context and you could fix the problem as soon as possible. So um, what I here I'm a big proponent of is using some form of optional typing, rather structural typing, which helps you exactly prevent those problems. So the moment you try to access some key that doesn't exist, the whole thing should explode. The moment you're using some wrong argument, the whole thing should explode. This is especially important if you are using or maybe even overusing currying because suddenly you can pass around a f one ar argument less and the function will still work, but it's not what you want to do. So, um, and here's some slight weight type checking helps tremendously. Again, just making sure that the program explodes at the point where you actually made the mistake, and which means that you have to hunt less through the, old, the stack traces where the, the mistake actually happened. So now looking forward, the next thing I would like in such a system would be to have more immediate feedback of the computation. So imagine, and this is a very, very simple, silly proof concept, but if you have a sort of explaining threading macro, which for each step of the computation would also show you a small bit of what the computation looks like. With some of that, it becomes way simpler to debug where you made the mistake, because oftentimes you'd have a mistake somewhere, and but it wouldn't be a mistake that would trip the type system off, but it still wouldn't um, coincide with what you were expecting. And otherwise, you have to do some form of more or less advanced debug debugging, but if you'd have the ability, and if this would, were integrated with your ID, you would immediately see w at which point the program started to produce results which you weren't expecting or wanting, and then fix that. Now first, actually, with the, the latest releases of CIDR, uh, we're moving in this direction when you have this, this inline result every time you evaluate something in the buffer, in the code buffer, you get this up, just the last line of results. But what I would ideally want is for any such chain computation to see all the steps in between. And then obviously the next step would be sort of something like Bird Victor has shown us um, the, the ability to change the whole thing um, as it is and just either changing numbers or whatever. And this again ties back to when I was talking about the need for a structural editor in the notebook. But this is something nice to have, um, but not something I'm actually actively working on. Okay, so, but still today, nowadays, doing data science also probably means doing some fancy things with machine learning. And here, closure is rather ill-served. And also, the Java ecosystem, aside from maybe Deep Learn 4J, is rather poor in terms of uh, support for various machine learning libraries. Um, so what do we do here? Well, we just compile the whole thing into Python, which uses scikit-learn and be done with it. And this is, as dumb as it sounds, this is actually a pretty powerful and simple approach to solving a lot of library problems, especially in domains which are so constricted. Because if you look at the average code using something like scikit-learn or any machine learning library, it's actually after you've done all the data preprocessing and feature engineering, which Clojure is excellent at, the whole thing is just basically you, put, you push your data into a function and then you get some data out. And this is trivial to generate such code and just pass it to Python. It's, yes, there is some overhead, but usually um, this whole thing is going to be dominated by running time anyway, so it doesn't matter if you're just shuffling the data around and run time, uh, just startup times are fast enough, again, to this not be a big issue. And this suddenly gives you a lot of power and you don't have to go hunting around for various libraries and fight with more or less developed libraries and so forth, but just use what's probably best of the best, or at least industry stand standard, and <coughs> stop thinking about it. I took the same approach with plotting, which again is something that currently is not very well served in the Clojure community. 
So um, what Hoodie contains is a DSL which compiles to R's ggplot and then we can use all the great uh, typesetting and layout and all the stuff that ggplot brings. Um, right now it's targeted only at Gorilla Repl, but it would be trivial to make to just take the SVG that's generated and use it for something else. Otherwise, it again follows the rest of the Hoodie's the library's design philosophy, and you get most of the charts that you would need out of the box. So a pretty picture, basically all this is, we take the closure description of the visualization we want, we generate R code on the fly, uh, send it to an R interpreter, which spits out an S SVG, which is then displayed here. It's super low tech, but it works nice, and you get visualizations which are way nicer than anything you can get out of the box in Clojure World. Um, the one point where it's sort of lacking and it would be nice to have, it would be some form of interactivity, which right now um, is lacking. But again, since this is SVG, it is, it doesn't seem to be all that difficult to, to add some JavaScript and have at least some uh, interactivity, but somewhere down the line, ideally, probably I would have different backends and not just ggplot, but also something like D3 or whatever in pure JavaScript to have really properly um, dynamic and interactive charts. The other thing I'm now working on is to have a optimizing threading macro. This is something that's quite common, for instance, in common Lisp world, where, where we have um, compiler macros which transform code into a more efficient version because when you have more contextual information of how various code blocks come together. And while Clojure doesn't have compiler macros, since almost all the, my usages of the library I've shown you are through threading macro, this is some functionality that you can just stuff in here. So what ideally I would like is to optimize where possible to use single pass instead of multipass for computation and to, you, to very aggressively use uh, transducer fusion because you can just throw away all the intermediate results. And also if we had some very lightweight metadata such as that sum is probably commutative as, as mean and so forth, we can also optimize a bit more aggressively. So again, this, probably this won't be a be-all, end-all um, compiler for such operations, but again, we, but we could take the most common um, combination, the most common patterns and uh, generate more efficient code. Which right now performance is not really a bottleneck, but it's something that is nice to have a bit faster always. So I think that the investment in doing something like that is relatively low, especially since Clojure is so adept at manipulating um, code. So I think it's a worthwhile investment. The last thing, some other cool projects from which I've either stolen ideas or have looked at them, and you might want to look at as well, and I know it really sucks to just put various projects on a screen, but I'm sure that slides are going to be available. Um, so the first two are two nice approaches to visualization. Uh, I think both use v Viga, Vega um, as the description language, and this is something that's a very likely path I would take if I would want to you have more interactive visualizations, or maybe I'll just use the ThinkGeom library, which seems, which seems very nicely made. Um, then there is Zeppelin project, which is a part of the Apache stack, and they are also a contender, a more general contender in the uh, notebook space, but they have a, it seems a very simple and very sane protocol for adding different kernels. So adding closure as a kernel to Zeppelin might be interesting as well, especially as Zeppelin is mostly uh, targets uh, the um, uh, Apache Fink and Spark, so um, a nice and tight interplay with those ecosystems would be nice for cases where we do actually have big data. Uh, then there is Tesser, which I've just stoned a lot of ideas in, in terms of how the library should look like, and it's a very good piece of Clojure code, so just recommend looking at it um, as such. And the last is Spectre, which, is, which takes a different approach to manipulating structures, and it's, um, it's something that in the, I was, when I saw it, I was very um, 
enthusiastic about it, but the more I was thinking about it and the more I was trying to use it, I sort of find out that it doesn't mesh well with how I think. So in the end, I didn't end up using it as extensively as I was hoping, but it's definitely a very fresh approach and something that's very much worth taking a look at. So um, as my light here is buzzing, the, the things that I want you to take from this talk uh, are five. Fundamentally, always think about the speed to answer. This is something that's not emphasized enough when doing data science, but it makes a huge difference when doing it in the real world in a company which actually stakes some of its outcomes on what you're doing with data. The second one is that even though we like to fetishize the uh, scientific or technological part, data science is fundamentally about communication. So think about having tools that facilitate this communication. Um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel for everything in Clojure, but we can just use the Clojure's immense capabilities of doing ad hoc compilers and just generate code for other languages. Um, along the same lines, Clojure is great for structural manipulation, so try to use that as much as possible and try to sort of just translate your problem from one to the other and use structure as the part of your computation. And last but not least, the, I, the forgotten idea of blurring the lines between your environment and the work you're doing is tremendously powerful and it's something that's worth thinking about and working more with in the future. So um, thank you for your time and if you have any questions or just crack me down with beer and... <laughs>
have the um, transducers just in the background, you don't have to worry about, okay, now I need to call sequence or introduce transducer or whatever on them or into, but this is already, it's already anticipated and it's anticipated in terms of, I sometimes use structures, maps and so forth, so did you have uh, proper ordering if you're doing anything with date times and so forth. So it's just a question of convenience. Um, it's a level of, abstraction which is too low for something general, I think, but it works well in this case because at any point, you you don't want to make assumptions as how this is going to be used and how it's going to be composed. And also, um, right now, we st still there are some functions that are missing in closure land in terms of transducer versions, so even if you would have all, the, all those things um, would implement it with transducers, you will still have to jump in and out by just inter interoperating with closure, which again is a trade-off I don't think is worthwhile. And <clears throat> some of those functions also just don't make sense as a transducer version because the moment you have any sort of sorting on that, you have to realize this the whole se sequence anyway. Okay. Thank you, Simon. So <laughs>